So our topic for today is justice in Islam, and specifically how the Prophet and his companions were the most just when it came to resolving issues and dealing with others. Before we begin, I would like to introduce our speaker, Hamza Chaudhry. Hamza was born in Whittier, California, and lived in Southern California until the age of 10, when he moved to Blaine, Washington. After graduating from Blaine High School, he went on to attend the University of Washington, and in 2004, completed a Bachelor's of Science in Biochemistry and a Bachelor's of Arts in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. During his study at the university, he was, an act he was active on campus, serving as the president of the UW Muslim Students Association, which was and is one of the largest and most active student groups on campus. After graduation, Hamza went on to pursue traditional Islamic studies, which took him to a number of countries, including Syria and Egypt, where he studied the Arabic language, Morocco, Mauritania, and UAE, where he studied the Madhab of Imam Malik, grammar, Surah al Hadith, and the two renditions of the Tira'a, Imam Nafi' Warsh Qalun, and finally Pakistan, where he had a, the opportunity to study Tafsir, Surah al Hadith, Hadith, Ilm al Rijal, and Hanafi Fiqh. Since his return, he has been active in working with the MSA at the University of Washington, teaching and giving khutbas at the Islamic House, uh, belonging to, a masjid belonging to the MSA UW. Now I would like to invite our chefs to come. إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون وصدق الله العظيم all praises to Allah, all praises to Allah, all praises to Allah who invited us to his Mubarak and blessed remembrance and we were not to be guided, was it not that Allah had guided us? O oh Allah, to you is praised as is commensurate with the majesty of your countenance and the greatness of your authority. O oh Allah, we do not limit you with any praise we can come up with ourselves, rather we admit that you're the only one who knows the true extent of your praiseworthiness. May the peace and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon his servant and messenger, our master Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May the peace and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon him and upon his uh, noble companions and upon his pure wives and upon his mubarak and blessed family and progeny and upon all of those who follow their way until the day of judgment. Uh, before we continue with the, uh, uh, the talk, uh, I wanted to thank first of all the MSA for having invited me. Uh, as you could tell, the the uh, bio was slightly out of date. MashaAllah, I, I moved away from uh, Seattle two years and some months ago. Uh, uh, I came back here after having first graduated from University of Washington, lived here. I came back after uh, several years of uh, study of, uh, of the traditional Islamic sciences in, in, in traditional seminaries uh, in different places in the Muslim world. And uh, uh, lived in Seattle for a number of years after that, and now I have moved to Chicago. Uh, I have to admit that uh, although I find my work very engaging over there, Seattle is a much better place to live. Uh, if someone in, you know, sees this video in Chicago, yes, I did say it, and uh, I'm not going to back down. Um, someone said, how are you going to live in Chicago, Shaykh? You make so much fun of Chicago. Uh, but uh, over the years, I found that it's very easy to make fun of Chicago and still live there, so alhamdulillah. Uh, the second thing I, I wanted to say is, mashallah, I always love to come back to the MSA. Uh, there is some sort of uh, charm and attraction to MSA, and it's more than just uh, have, it's more than something having to do with some sort of nostalgia for one's bygone youth. Um, and the charm and attraction of MSA is what is that this is a platform where people from different uh, backgrounds, different uh, ethnic backgrounds, different socioeconomic backgrounds, from different countries, from different uh, uh, just you know from all all different walks of life, even people from different faith groups and whatnot. Uh, they can come together and, uh, and, and, and come together for, for a good purpose and for a common purpose and better themselves and help each other out in the process. Uh, that's that's the, the second thing I wanted to mention. And the third thing I wanted to mention was one, is that uh, uh, the idea with uh, giving talks or the sunnah or the custom of giving talks in uh, the Muslim tradition is this, is that 
the best of speech is what is short and what uh, uh, indicates to a person what they need to know. And that's why we consider the best part of the speech to be the doxology, the, the, the benediction that's said in the beginning of it. Why? Because it's something that's jami', it's comprehensive. And so we start with the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the praise of God Almighty, uh, and with the uh, 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 prayers uh, for uh, those righteous people who came before us and showed us a better way to live. And then we start from the recitation of the Holy Quran, which is something that uh, I mean, has a number of benefits. Uh, if nothing else, it's something that calms and focuses people's attention to uh, what talk is going to be said, what speech is going to be said. So since I was given the topic of justice, uh, I wanted to first lay the uh, usuli and theoretical framework about the discussion regarding justice because sound practice can only be uh, achieved when it's laid on the back of sound theoretical principles. Sound practice can only be achieved when it's laid on the back of sound theoretical principles. We believe in an ordered universe. We don't believe in a chaotic universe. We don't believe in uh, taking shots in the dark and hoping that one day the bullet is going to hit the, the right target. That's not, that's not the uh, kind of ethos of Islam. Islam is a religion that very much makes a person, forces a person to think about who they are, where they are, why they're there, etc., etc., what their goals are, what their vision is for the future, and keeps telling a person to base, based on that uh, vision that they have uh, that's based on thought and, and meditation and reflection uh, to base their, um, their actions on that knowledge uh, and on that sound understanding and if the action doesn't render the results that were hoped for then a person can see where things went wrong but we never uh, have this kind of fatalism of, of venturing out into the dark and you know let's see what happens so we start with a discussion regarding the place of justice in Islam. And the place of justice in Islam is described in Surah Al-Ma'idah, which is the Fatiha Baqarah Al-Imran Nisa, the fifth, uh, the fifth chapter of the Quran. Uh, and Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says in that place, He says what? It says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you who believe, Qumu lillahi, stand in front of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, stand in front of God at attention. And standing means not just to stand physically, but in, a, in the world of meanings to stand for something. Well, we say so and so stands for something. So you stand for God. Uh, be the ones who stand for the sake of God. Uh, and be people who are witnesses to justice. Meaning what? Don't let something that's, uh, that violates the precepts of justice happen and you're just standing there and watching and doing nothing. Because we believe that something that is a sin to do and something that is a, 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 an, act, an act of iniquity to do, it's also an act of iniquity to bear witness to that thing and not do something to change it if you're able to change it. So much so that if a person is not physically able to change an act of injustice or iniquity, that person is still commanded to speak out against it. And if they cannot speak out against it, and this is something that happens, and may God protect us from such a uh, situation where even speaking out for the truth will oftentimes land a person into, uh, uh, a, into jail or punishment or adverse circumstances that they cannot handle. Even if that's a case, a person is still expected to, at least within their heart, hate what uh, is going on that's wrong and to at least beseech God's help uh, in order to uh, uh, have some sort of circumstance come about which will suppress this iniquity. Uh, and that's the least part of faith, meaning if a person cannot do that much, it's a sign that faith has left their heart. So what do we say? Shuhada bin qist. That when you bear witness to something, let it be just. And if it's unjust, don't stand and don't bear witness to it. Uh, this word qist is a very interesting word in the Arabic language. Um, if anybody here is uh, familiar with the, uh, the kind of the exegetical tradition of the Quran or the Torah for that matter, uh, language is a big deal. Uh, language is a really big deal. The Muslims uh, preserve the Quran in Arabic and they insist on it being read in Arabic and, and a, a translation is not considered the Quran. It's considered to be like a commentary on the Quran. But if it's not in the original language, then how could you? How could it be revelation? You miss you miss so much by uh, by just translating it because it becomes a, a kind of an interpretation of an individual on scripture rather than the scripture itself. So people who have some sort of rabbinic training or whatnot oftentimes appreciate this, although the, the typical American audience is not uh, immediately attuned to why uh, you know what importance the original language has. The word this actually has a cognate in the English language. Does anyone know what it is? 
Hmm? No, that, that's a translation of the word pissed. The word pissed actually has a cognate in the, in, in the English language. A cognate, meaning the word is actually, there's a word in the English language that's the same, made up of the same letters and it has the same meaning. So the word this, it means, uh, uh, like our brother uh, said, it, one of the things it means is justice, one of the things it means is an installment of something. Uh, meaning you have like a number of even, evenly broken up payments. So if you're going to pay something in payments, the pay payments are evenly broken up, meaning they're broken up in a just way, meaning at least materially they're, they're equal to one another. Um, and the word has a, uh, uh, there's another word that comes from the same root. Uh, pistas, it's mentioned in the Quran several times also. And pistas is actually a cognate for the English word justice. It's a word, there's a couple of words from the Quran, uh, a handful of words that are actually uh, uh, loan words from other languages. And so the Mufassirin, the interpreters, the exegetes of the Quran say that the word pistas comes from Latin. And uh, in fact, to this day, if anyone, is anyone here from the Khalid, from the Arabian Gulf? Yeah, mashallah. What happens, like if someone, his name is Qasim in, in Qatar or whatever, in Qatar, what do they say? They say it's Jasim, Fulan Abu Jasim, right? Yeah. So if you actually pronounce the Qaf like a Jim, like the tribes of the Eastern Arabian Peninsula do, Qistas actually means Jistas, which actually sounds exactly like the word justice, right? They say, Qunu qawamina bil qist. Be people who, qawamina lillahi shu'ada bil qist. Be people who stand for God and be people who bear witness to nothing but what? To justice. And don't let uh, your enemies carry you to such a point that your anger overwhelms you and you're not able to be just with people anymore. And the word shana'an is a uh, plural of the word shani. Right? Allah Ta'ala mentions this word in, in another part of the Quran that may, maybe some of you have memorized as well. The word shanit means not just any enemy, but that enemy who is so despicable and so horrible that you see no good in them, no virtue in them whatsoever. Sometimes there's like a clash between two, you know, heroes. Like there's a championship boxing fight and then whoever wins, the, you know, both of them say, you know, it was a good fight and you put in your best and you have an honorable opponent and you're both going for the same thing and, and, and you respect one another. Shana is that enemy who is horrible, who will lie, cheat, steal, kill, uh, 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 do anything to destroy you, has no morals, have no redeeming qualities, neither materially nor spiritually. And so the Quran says that even those people who are that ruthless and that horrible with you, don't ever let your anger and your ill will toward them carry you to a point where you're not able to be just with people. Rather, have, 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 uh, you know, treat people, such people with justice. Why? Because it is closer to what God's right is of you in terms of your dealing with Him. That the violation of justice with other people ultimately is a violation of justice with, with, with Himself. So this is the first verse of the Qur'an upon which we will build the rest of the talk, the theoretical understanding of the rest of, the rest of the talk. The second verse though is the one I wanted to share with you which kind of takes things to another level and it is, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it shows a concept that I think perhaps in some ways distinguishes Islam from uh, 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 a lot of other kind of Neoplatonic uh, 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 religious uh, 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 kind of strains of thought. Which is what? Which is that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another place, He says that verily uh, uh, Allah, verily God commands you to, in Allah bil adl, He commands you to justice, uh, when ihsan and to to, to perfection, to beauty, but ita idul qurba. So you have three levels here. The lowest level of which is justice. If you owe somebody five dollars, you give them five dollars. If somebody you wrong them, you return what their right is. If somebody comes to you and asks for what their right is, or somebody comes to you and they have some sort of right over you, you give them what, what's due to them. In the lahayat murukum bil adil, the first commandment is toward what? To justice. People say no justice, no peace. I think this is, this is something that, you know, respectfully, this is something that our, our Quranic worldview doesn't endorse. What's the first thing that you're commanded to is justice. If you cannot give somebody what their due is, you have some sort of problem uh, in your mind. There's something dysfunctional in your head, either mathematically or morally and sometimes both. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you cannot understand why somebody's rights are due to them, you have a problem at a whole other level. This is not the, uh, uh, this is not the end all or the goal of of spirituality, rather this is only the beginning of it. If you cannot 
do this much, you don't, don't have permission to enter the door uh, of being a spiritual person or of being a righteous person or of being a person who has any claim to any sort of connection with God or with any, uh, uh, with any goodness either uh, uh, in the world of material or in the world of uh, 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 the spirit. You have no claim to any of these things. But on the, on the back of that justice is what? Adl wal ihsan. Ihsan literally, it's an Arabic word, it literally means to make things beautiful. And it's something that doesn't translate so uh, easily uh, into English, but it's something that means literally to make things beautiful, but it's to do something with perfection, to go above and beyond what's asked of you. To go above and beyond what's asked of you. So, for example, what is Ihsan? Ihsan is what? That if there's a no smoking sign on, on, you know, on a, around a building, so no smoking inside this building, what do you do? You stand in the doorway and you start smoking a cigarette. This is, this, is, this is what? This is a very literalistic interpretation of the law. Maybe because people would do that at a time now, most codes are such that you have to stand 30 feet or 40 feet away from the door. What if you stand 30 feet away from the door just puffing away in people's face uh, so that they see you, right? This is the use of justice in such a way that defeats its purpose because there's a dispute or a dis debate about the, the letter of the law and the spirit of the law, which is more important. And really the answer is both. You cannot sacrifice one in order to appease the other. It's like somebody saying, I prefer to have my left hand rather than my right hand, or my right hand rather than my left hand. You may have somewhat of a point that there's certain things your right hand does that your left hand can't, or vice versa. But a person who's missing either of them, there's some problem there. Obviously if somebody's actually missing their hand, obviously they can live a full and useful and productive life. We don't think that they're less of a human being. But if they had a choice, that say, hey, you know, you just keep one of them. Like, just let the other one go, because one's better than the other. See, so you're out of your mind, man. Uh, no one would choose that as a, a way of life uh, for themselves without, uh, you know, without any need to uh, go down that road. So both of them, both of them are things that, that have their function in there their place and both of them have uh, some sort of benefit and it's important for us not to knock one at the, ex at the expense of the, uh, not knock one and put the other one up at the expense of the other. Uh, but what is it that on the back of this justice is ihsan, that you go out of your way not to bother people, you go out of your way, you think 10 steps ahead uh, of what you do and what impact your actions will have and if there's any chance that it's going to do anything to disrupt a person or anger a person, or uh, uh, disrupt their rights, or their uh, uh, honor that's due to them as a human being, uh, you uh, avoid it altogether. And the reason, the impetus for this ihsan being something that is uh, 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 written as a commandment for the creation, the reason for that is what? Is that if we nickel and dime one another in every sort of transaction, that listen, you step you know, five feet over the line on my property, I'm gonna call the police and we're gonna duke this all out in court. The reason for that is what? Is the understanding that if a person were to have to stand in front of the court of God Most High and account for the law as it's been revealed, nobody would come out on top. Nobody would come out on top. This is a very deep well. I mean, we don't have time to explain this concept in its, in its full, but a, a very instructional story about this. Because people think, oh, well, if I'm not doing anything wrong, I should be okay. Uh, uh, and the fact of the matter is you're doing so many things. All of us are doing so many things that are, are so horrible, we don't even think about them. And the fact that we didn't know thinks that it mitigates it somehow. It actually makes it worse, to be honest with you, because we're not thinking about what we do. How many people sitting here, your shoes were made by a child sitting in a sweatshop that was robbed of, uh, of, of, of their childhood, chained to a workstation, and we never even knew. While we are uh, upset that we didn't get into the major we wanted to, or you know, upset that you know, so-and-so uh, you know, cooked a, a dinner with uh, non-organic onions instead of organic onions, or all these kind of other things that we have, we get upset about that, you know, like driving a, a, a Honda and I should be driving an Acura or whatever. Uh, all of us get upset about this, we don't even think about that. You don't think about it. I mean, has, has, does anyone here eat chicken? Go ahead, admit it, admit it. Okay, do you know how those chickens are raised? Think about like the most horrible and inhumane and just, just foul way you could treat another living thing. That's how like your organic chickens are raised. The ones that are like just the, the commodity level uh, animals, it's like utterly like it's despicable, it's disgusting, right? 
Think about it. This is a this is a part of Islam. This is part of the core belief of Islam as well. The belief that everyone will come face to face one day with all the actions that they do. They have to account in front of God. So you're thinking, oh man, I had a hard enough time, you know, not, uh, you know, with the whole, uh, you know, figuring out which shoes are not made in a sweatshop and all this other type of stuff. And so you see, like, mashallah, the, the 20,000 chickens you ate in your lifetime, or however many you see them show up on that day. You say, I didn't even think about that. I didn't even think about that. The function of ihsan in our, our belief system is what? Is that you have ihsan toward one another and it will be an excuse for Allah Ta'ala, for God Most High to have ihsan on, your, on you. Don't nickel and dime other people lest you wish to be nickel and dime that, on that day. Kama to deen to dan. It's a hadith and it's a saying of the Arabs. The way that you dish it out, that's the way one day you're going to take it. So this is the function of ihsan. And this is something very important because oftentimes people, especially who have activist mentality, uh, and I myself consider myself to be such a person, but justice becomes this goal and we think that somehow justice is uh, like an end and it's not an end. It's a means to what? It's a means to allowing people to live their life in such a way that they don't have to worry about someone robbing and stealing, cheating them, killing them, etc., etc. They can live life with the amount of safety and security that a person needs in order to concentrate on higher things and, and, and turn their heart and their mind toward uh, uh, higher reasons for existing rather than self-preservation. <coughs> justice is not an end, justice is only the beginning. And if a person has justice but they don't have ihsan, then that justice is not going to last forever. What do you think today if we took all the wealth, redistributed it, everyone whose forefathers were wronged at some time in history, they got the compensation that they were due, everyone who was wronged for something or another, you know, even down to the smallest thing that you were in fourth grade and, you know, you wanted to be class president and somebody, you know, said something wrong or lied about you and so the kids didn't vote about it. So you got to go back in time and become class president like you deserve to be. You think all of those things were, 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 were righted, all those wrongs were righted one day. MashaAllah, Nahum students, MashaAllah. All those wrongs were righted one day. Do you think that, that the whole universe is going to live happily ever after? No, because if Ihsan is not there in the world, it will just be another peak from which things are going to start rolling downhill once again, as they were from before. So we say what? We say, Inna Allah ya'muru bil adl. He commands to what? To justice. And on the back of justice, what? Ihsan. You go above and beyond what is required of you from justice because you expect the same thing from God on the day that you meet Him and you hope for the same thing from God on the day that you meet Him on the day of judgment in which there is no doubt uh, and He uh, commands to what? Giving to your relatives and it's very interesting that giving to your relatives here is a very specific, uh, 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 a very specific thing uh, and what, what, what's important to understand is what does it re represent right? Justice is I get what I'm getting and I'll give you what you're getting. Ihsan is I'll let you keep the change. Ita'i dhul qurba is what? What I have I want to give to you as well. This is, this is the level that a person is supposed to aspire to. This is the level that someone is supposed to aspire to. Why? Because has anyone here been inside of a mosque before? What do you do when you walk into a mosque with your shoes? What do you do with them? Hamad, you're the president of the MSA, you should know this man. Huh? You take them off. Why? You're, the mosque is clean. You don't want to attract dirt and uh, garbage into the mosque. But your shoes are, you went to the bathroom in them. And you know, it may have been raining. They may be wet. They may have mud in them. They may have grass on them. What do you do? You take them off and you put them in the shoe rack. You cannot enter the mosque with them because the mosque is inappropriate to enter into that place. There's a beautiful metaphor for this, which is what? As long as a person has these shahwat bahimiya, alwath bahimiya, these sort of um, this dirtiness of, 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 of animalistic uh, uh, kind of desire or propensity. Uh, and when we say animalistic, we're not talking about your, you know, like your dog, you know, when you play the good times you had together. We're talking about like when one, uh, you know, when one rat eats the other rat type of, that drive that, that, that makes a person stop at nothing and sacrifice their humanity uh, and the principles that human beings uh, hold in common cur currency. Um, in order to just satisfy some sort of desire which in and of itself doesn't get anyone anywhere, right? So they talk about evolution and natural selection and, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, one species survival of the fittest and you're propagating your genes and all of this stuff. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful theory. It makes a lot of sense on so many levels. If there's another theory that makes more sense, then we'll uh, like that as well. It's not a dogma that we keep, nor is it something we dogmatically shut out. But, okay, fine. 
You're successful evolutionarily. Your genes are propagated until you know God knows when in the future. Your genes are your genes are your genes are here to stay. They're on every continent. When you die, what, what benefit is it to you? What benefit is it? What, what what happiness does it give you? The the thing that you're the thing that you're going for, the goal that you're trying to achieve is what? Is that you have this this sort of uh, communion with something greater than who you are, uh, with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, with with God who is greater than what you are and more perfect than what you are and more beautiful than what you are. And just like that mosque, when you enter into it, you go for the uh, for, for, for your communion with God. Uh, you enter, you have to take your shoes off. Just like that, your heart has to take its shoes off before it enters into uh, uh, communion with God. And the physical communion that happens inside of a masjid is secondary compared to the spiritual communion that happens inside the heart. So this greed, this uh, 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 lust, this desire, this animalistic uh, uh, nature uh, of a person and Islam is not the religion that says that a person cannot be who they are Islam doesn't command people toward celibacy Islam doesn't command people to starve themselves to death there are religious traditions in this world that that do that Islam says yes you have certain uh, uh, needs because you do have a physical body go ahead and fulfill them to the degree that they need to be fulfilled in a natural way even if you enjoy yourself enjoy yourself doing that but don't let that take over what you're what your, your goal in life is, what your purpose in life is. That's what Ita Idul Qurba represents. That when you're willing to give of, of yourself and from yourself to others, on the outside it looks like you're being generous, but on the inside what is it? The heart is taking out off his shoes. Why? Why? Because dirty things cannot enter into the holy presence of God. Uh, that's what that represents. And so that's the, the goal of all of these things. Is that if you're a good person, if you're a bad person, etc., etc., even good character and even kindness, even piety, even respect for other people, even kindness to animals and living things, etc., all of these things are what? They are just a means in order for a person to attain communion with his Creator. And this is what our Prophet, peace be upon him, teaches us, and this is what the Quran teaches us. So that's what we have justice, that's why we have justice, and that's what the ultimate goal is that the justice is only a stop along the way of a much longer journey and a much longer trip. Now, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, he was somebody that uh, 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 was a person of ihsan. He's a person of ihsan. He's a person not of justice, but he's a person of ihsan. There are a number of stories regarding him, uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and how he used to deal with people. And there is a qaida, if a person reads the, I forget, not everyone here is an Arabic speaker. Al-Qaeda is like a, a, like a terrorist organization. We're not talking about that. Uh, that's, that's a different letter, and who knows what the difference between a Hamza and a Ayn is in the Arabic language. But at any rate, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking, there's a principle, there's a, there's a, there's a foundational principle. Uh, if you read the life story of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that anyone who ever did anything against this person, uh, he would forgive them. Anyone who did anything against the uh, uh, against the, uh, uh, the, 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 the body of Muslims, against the body of Muslims, those people, justice would be applied to them. And this is something that will clear up a lot of uh, questions that you'll have when you read the, uh, the prophetic biography. But you'll see time and time again uh, stories of people throwing garbage on him, stories of people uh, <coughs> trying to kill him, uh, stories of people doing many things. He would forgive them. He would forgive them. It's a, 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 a character above justice. So you see what? There is a, uh, uh, there is a story uh, about the uh, uh, Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, that uh, him and his companions were uh, 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 traveling through the desert. And there was a place that they stopped to take shade. There was a number of trees that they stopped to take shade in during the midday because it was very difficult to travel in the midday uh, of the desert heat. So they stopped to take a siesta, a midday nap. And so what happened is there's a, a, a grove of trees and then one tree that's separate from the other ones that are, is in a higher place. So his companions, they said, we'll sleep in the grove and we'll let him sleep alone so no one bothers him. Uh, 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 we'll sit, let him sleep alone in this raised place. It's something that uh, out of their love for him, they, they, they said that this is something that's uh, proper for him to sleep in this place. So what happens is that all of them are so tired they go to sleep. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he takes his sword and he hangs it from uh, the tree and he goes to sleep in the shade of the tree. When he wakes up, he sees that there's a Bedouin uh, raider. So Bedouins are nomadic people. They just they raid uh, 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 sedentary peoples and, and travelers for their uh, for their uh, uh, livelihood. So he raids. Uh, so a raider comes to him, and he's far away from everybody else. And by the time people figure out what's going on, uh, he already is standing over him with his sword unsheathed. 
and he says, uh, he says that, uh, 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 who's going to save you from me now? And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi says, who? He says, God will save me. And so what happens, his hand trembles and he drops the sword. And then he says, uh, uh, he picks the sword up and holds it over the head of this Bedouin and says, who's going to save you from me now? And so the person says that, I just ask you that you be a, a good person, a kind person uh, to me in this moment. And so he let him go. He let him go. There are stories like this. They are, they are they're, they're many in number. And if a person may think that this is some sort of hagiography, there are kind of larger kind of geopolitical uh, uh, realities that a person has to come to terms with regarding the prophetic uh, biography. Um, and, and they include, uh, I guess, the, the greatest and the most well uh, uh, attested to historical event is that he was a person who made his claim uh, against his people who were idol worshippers that there's only one God and that there's no uh, benefit in worshipping idols and to uh, stop uh, drunkenness and alcoholism and to stop uh, 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 classism and to uh, uh, stop a system in which the strong oppress the weak and to uh, uh, stop a system in which uh, uh, female uh, infants are buried alive because of their uselessness or perceived uselessness in society. Uh, because he made this claim, uh, his people uh, tortured him and they uh, persecuted him and him and a band of his followers, they left. Uh, they had to leave and flee from Makkah Mukarramah uh, under, uh, under duress, under the threat of violence and, 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 and murder. And uh, what happens is that they uh, come to another city, uh, uh, which is now known as Medina, and they uh, kind of make their society into uh, what they want it to be. The people of Medina accept his, um, accept his calling, and they accept the way of life that he preaches, and it becomes such a great state and such a powerful state that a day comes when they are militarily and politically in a position that they can uh, come back and claim what was rightfully theirs, what they were uh, kicked out of in the first place in the original home in Mecca. And that day, what happened? It's the ancient world. What happens when people have, uh, you know, when one army has victory over the other, what ends up happening? Usually there's a mass slaughter, there's a uh, general uh, slaughter, there's killing, there's enslavement, there's all sorts of things that happen like that. And uh, this is something that's a verifiable fact of history that the Muslim are, Muslims are under the uh, uh, command of uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they took over Makkah Mukarramah and not a drop of blood was shed. In fact, uh, uh, in fact uh, uh, there was a special amnesty given to people and they were given time uh, to think about uh, whether they wanted to uh, uh, accept this new political reality. Some people rejected it and left, uh, but nobody was killed and nobody was dispossessed of their property. And this is something that's amazing, it's a singular act in, in the history of humanity. I challenge a person to bring something like that from the annals of history. There are things that happen afterward, but there's nothing that happens beforehand like that. Generally what happens is that in the ancient world you cannot afford to allow your enemies to survive. Why? Because they will plot and scheme against you. And what happens is that today is your day of victory, then tomorrow will be theirs. And if you don't kill them when you have a chance, oftentimes they won't make the same mistake. But there is something special and unique about his. Uh, uh, about his message and about his conquest, that he managed to conquer the hearts uh, of the people, thus uh, uh, you know, ensuring that Islam has uh, a, 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 an even more enthusiastic base of, uh, of supporters uh, from amongst his enemies than uh, many people have amongst their own allies. And so this is something that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi this is something that uh, he established. I wanted to actually move on and concentrate on the person of one of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, who is well known, uh, 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 well known throughout the students of, uh, of history, and his name is Umar ibn Khattab. Umar ibn Khattab is an interesting person in the sense that he was one of the most ardent uh, uh, enemies of Islam and of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And he, uh, uh, because of what? Because of his propensity of, to, toward justice, something strange happened. That one day he became so upset with. Uh, the, the, the mission and the preaching of the Prophet Muhammad uh, during his early uh, uh, days of prophethood that he set out to kill him. He set out to kill him. He said this person is causing uh, strife and he's causing the young people of our society to go against the ways of their forefathers and their elders and uh, I'm going to put an end to this right now with my own sword. And so when he's on his way to kill the Prophet Muhammad he sees a friend of his who is secretly a Muslim but he doesn't know yet. And so this friend of his says to him, what? He says, uh, you're going to kill uh, Muhammad. Why don't you take care of your own family first? He says, what? 
said, what do you mean? He says, your sister has become a Muslim. Now you're going to go kill somebody from another family. You cannot straighten out your own household first. So this shocks him. Right? This is something very interesting. Oftentimes there are people, you know, nobody is completely good and nobody is completely evil from amongst normal people, amongst the great majority of people. People have a mix of what's going on inside. That's why it's important to try to understand where people are coming from and try to, uh, you know, uh, talk to them before you kind of pass judgment. So this is one thing in him, and I see this, especially amongst religious people, uh, may God forgive us and protect us from this. Even amongst religious people, there are people who are extremely, extremely merciful on themselves, and extremely harsh and unforgiving and un not understanding for other people. Whereas the commandment of God was what? That that type of scrutiny is something that you reserve for yourself, and the mercy and kindness we show to ourselves, we should be showing to others. So this is a really a foul character in a lot of people. This was something that Omar, even in his jahiliya, even in his uh, era of disbelief, he didn't have in him. So he understood this, that this is something that I have no right to go to somebody from another family and chastise them for something that I haven't been able to straighten out in my house first. So what happens is he goes to, uh, he goes, he's on his way to kill the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he goes to his sister's house. And then his sister, what happens is he's very angry as a person who, uh, uh, his temper gets uh, the better of him at this time and it's something that uh, after his Islam he works on uh, quite a great deal in order to dissipate uh, to the point that when he becomes a man of old age he's well known for being a person who uh, 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 you know, is very quiet and thinks first before saying anything or doing anything out of fear of the anger of his youth. So in his anger he goes to his sister's house and he sees his sister and brother-in-law with a, with a copy of parchment uh, on which some verses, the verses of Surah Taha from the Quran are written and, uh, uh, and he says what is this chanting and nonsense noise I hear from, from you and his sister says this is the, the book of Allah and, she, and he says this is nothing so he pushes her away and he hits her in the face, he slaps her in the face and, and it causes her to start bleeding and so what happens when he sees his sister he hit her so hard that she's bleeding Something came over him and he said, this is not right, what just happened, this is not right for a man to strike a woman like that and for, uh, you know, for, for me to do this to, to my sister, something felt wrong. So he said, uh, you know, and, uh, trying, to, trying to kind of backtrack and be a little bit more conciliatory, he says, let me see what's in the scroll first. Let me see what's in the scroll first. And so what happens, his sister says, you cannot touch it without being in a state of ritual purity. Which is a proof for those of you who are Muslims, mashallah, that even at that early stage, the sacred law was something that was very important. People used to pay attention to the sacred law. It's not something that's of secondary importance. But at any rate, uh, so what happens is that she teaches him how to physically purify himself to make the ablution. He washes his hands and his face and his feet, etc., etc. Which you may have seen some Muslim doing in the sink. So try not to uh, try not to freak out or whatever. Uh, so what happens is like you pray in an airport. They're like, oh my God, he's gonna take the plane down. As if you only pray before you're about to kill people. You mean you pray at other times as well, right? I mean, anyway. So what happens is that, so, that so, so, so he makes the ablution and he reads from the scroll and he says, this is not, this is not, you know, something that's so bad. And then he goes to visit the Prophet, peace be upon him. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that he's sitting with his uncle, whose name is Hamza, after whom my parents named me. And so Hamza is also kind of a big tough guy like Omar was. And so the, the other companions are like scared that this guy is coming and he's known to not like Islam. And so Hamza says, don't worry about it. He says, Omar is at the door, don't worry about it. If he wants to do something nice, we'll be nice to him. And if he wants trouble, we'll give him trouble. Uh, and so what happens is that, that Omar comes through the door and he accepts Islam. He says, I testify that there's no God except for one and that you are his messenger to the Prophet peace be upon him. So this person goes through this kind of incredible journey with the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and becomes one of his foremost companions and after the Prophet peace be upon him dies uh, the Prophet peace be upon him after he dies one of his companions whose name is Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr who is uh, 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 kind of the senior most amongst his companions he will be his successor but he will only live for a very short amount of time, less than two years. After which Omar then will be the successor and he will uh, uh, basically oversee uh, the, uh, the, the political and the religious affairs of the Muslims for uh, almost a good eight years. And many of the traditions of Islam actually will be cemented during that time, during that rule. And he's a very legendary person. I mean, the, the stories about him are, 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 are really interesting and there's something that I encourage anyone who's interested to go uh, look up, be, be, uh, uh, be they Muslims or of other faith, uh, other faith uh, uh, traditions to look up and to read. Uh, he was someone that uh, Gandhi was very inter interested and very inspired by. And Gandhi actually what happened was there was a Hindu-Muslim riot that occurred 
Uh, unfortunately, these types of things used to occur uh, and still occur quite frequently in the Indian subcontinent. We pray for people to, uh, uh, you know, uh, to mature out of this uh, kind of phase of pettiness. But there was a Hindu Muslim riot and some Muslim had come up to him thinking that he's a party to the violence and tried to intimidate him. He says, don't mess with the Muslims. Don't you know we're the people of Omar? We're the people of Omar ibn Khattab. Gandhi laughed at his face. He says, look at you. You say you're the people of Omar. He said, if you had anyone like Omar with you right now, the British wouldn't have been able to come to our lands and enslave our forefathers and put us in the mess that we're in uh, already. Right? So this is what this shows a, 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 a kind of a sign of his respect. And so one story I wanted to share about him was what, that there was a, a, a client state uh, of, the, of the Byzantine Empire in the north, an Arabic-speaking state. Uh, it was called Ghassan. Ghassan is uh, where modern-day like Jordan and uh, Syria, like the southern part of Syria are right now. And it was an independent kingdom, and there were Arabic-speaking people. People don't know this, but there was actually one Roman emperor who was actually an Arabic speaker also. His name was Philip the Arab. Uh, 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 and there were a number of Semitic speaking uh, Roman emperors as well. I mean, it was a very interesting place. It was a place that produced a lot of very incredible people, to say the least, uh, in the time of late antiquity. So what happens is the king of Ghassan, he will accept Islam. He was a Christian before and he will accept Islam. And uh, he will come to Mecca Mukarrama, to, to Mecca to make Hajj of, uh, of the, uh, uh, to make Hajj to make the annual pilgrimage uh, of the Kaaba in Mecca Mukarrama, which is a, a holy city of the Muslims. Uh, to make this kind of annual pilgrimage. And what happens is he's, he's a king. I mean, the, the, uh, there's a story regarding his, he's a king, his name is Jabla. The story of the opulence of Jabla's court is described by one of the uh, ambassadors uh, of Sayyidina Omar radiallahu anhu that when he was taking a message to Heraclius, the Byzantine emperor, uh, um, Heraclius told him, you know, you're, you're an Arab guy, Jabla. I said, do you, you want to know what his status is amongst us? He says, uh, I don't know. He says, go to such and such place and go visit him. So he goes to that place and he sees that there is a palace like the palace of the emperors and doorman like the doorman of the emperor and protocol like the protocol of the Roman, uh, the Byzantine emperor. And when he enters, he sees ornate chairs and tables, all sorts of food uh, spread out. And after the food is done, what happens is that singing girls are called in and musicians are called in to sing uh, and, and play music and sing Arabic poetry. During which time there is a large, uh, uh, like a, a large, uh, uh, like a fountain um, with uh, with uh, with solid musk. Musk is a uh, type of perfume. Uh, it's extremely expensive. So there's granulated musk in it. So what happens? They bring cages of doves, and they open the cages of the doves, and the doves will wash themselves around in the musk. You know, like a chicken will bathe in dirt. They'll do that, and what will happen is then they'll open the cage up and they'll fly all around this, this, this uh, kind of this, uh, uh, this royal chamber, and it will shower down while the singing girls are singing in their beautiful clothes and with their instruments and things like that. It will shower down this perfume. It's a complete show of opulence. So this is who this guy is. He's a, he's a big shot. So what happens? He becomes Muslim. He comes to go and uh, 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 make pilgrimage of uh, uh, the house of Makkah Mukarramah, the prime right of which is that you have to circumambulate the, the holy mosque seven times. And the problem is there's no VIP section or first class section. Even to this day, when you go for Hajj, when you go for the pilgrimage to Makkah Mukarrama, there are certain packages that people go on, cost $2,000, $1,500. From extremely poor countries, people are, you know, like, they kind of rough out some very tough conditions. And you'll have these kind of weird, uh, uh, like, Russian oligarch type uh, uh, Hajj packages. Uh, where you know you can have like a huge suite and there's a jacuzzi and bathtub and you can see the holy mosque from whatever uh, you know 70th story that you're in and whatnot. But the problem is this is that when you go to circumambulate the Kaaba, when you go to walk around the Kaaba in this most holy rite of the pilgrimage, there's no VIP section. <laughs> So you run into all kinds of people, speak all kinds of different languages, all kinds of different character, all kinds of different notions of what etiquette are, etc., etc. And it's funny that you get pushed from somebody and, you know, it, being a big guy, you know, it's, it's very difficult because, you know, people who are smaller, they say, oh, he's a big guy, can take it. <laughs> you know? So what happens is, is, is that this Jabla, who is this, like, big shot in the Byzantine kind of food chain, he goes to circumambulate around the Kaaba and uh, a Bedouin, who is just a, a nomad, an illiterate person, a poor person, uh, probably a very rough and simple person. Um, he doesn't watch where he's going, he bumps into him. So Jabla in anger says, you, you 
idiot, look where you're going. And he punches him, he hits him really hard. You know, so this Bedouin, he, 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 he cries and he complains to Omar. He goes to Omar and says, this, this person I was circumambulating around the Kaaba, I was walking around the Kaaba, I bumped into him by accident and he punched me. And uh, uh, what happens is that uh, Omar calls then Jabla and this Bedouin and he, he asks him, he says, is it true that, uh, that you punched him? He says, uh, he says, yeah, he should have watched where he was going. You know, this, he doesn't even know who I am, etc., etc. And so uh, uh, what happens is that uh, uh, Omar says, he says, that he, so you admit it? He says, yes. He says, punch him back. Jabla says, whoa. <laughs> I just became Muslim. I didn't sign up for this, you know. Uh, he says this is kind of a shock because in our old system, this would have never been allowed. So give me, give me a week to prepare, and I'll present myself in front of you again, and uh, then he can take his his uh, his uh, right of retribution. So what happens is that uh, uh, this Jabla, who's the king of Hassan, he uh, slips out and he goes back to the Byzantine emperor and he renounces his Islam and uh, joins the orbit of the Byzantine state again, uh, claiming Christianity. And this is something, if there are Christians here, they'll know that this is not the behavior uh, uh, that, is, uh, uh, that is championed by the teachings of Christ. But at any rate, that's what he does. He goes back to his cozy power structure in which he's insulated from justice. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's something that, uh, that, 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 that Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala who he knew that this was the, 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 the outcome of it, but it was something he wouldn't tolerate uh, from his. Uh, from his rule out of the fear that God would ask him on the day of judgment that you didn't uh, even enforce the bare minimum of justice amongst the people so now you you bear the consequence for all the vulnerable for all the oppression and tyranny that happens under your watch another incident happens during his reign uh, in which uh, Amr bin Asr who, who is the governor of Egypt uh, his son one of his sons will get into a, a dispute with somebody a trade dispute with somebody and uh, words get heated and he will uh, uh, actually have that person beaten because he goes around with the entourage, he'll have his kind of goons hold him down and beat, beat them. This person who gets beaten, he comes to Medina and he says his complaint to Sayyidina Umar ta'ala who promptly uh, orders that Amr, the governor and his son both be produced in front of him. Both be produced in front of him. And uh, he again, the same thing he asked, did this happen? And they, they will admit to it. And so he'll hand his own staff to, uh, uh, to this person and say, now beat Amr bin As's son in front of all of us, just as, exactly the same way he beat you, and uh, know that justice is served. And so they expected this was going to happen. They knew the whole ride over this was going to happen, Omar is going to do this. What happens afterward is amazing. Uh, he then gives him the staff and says, now beat his father uh, for, uh, uh, for allowing such a thing to happen under his watch. And Amr bin As is, is, is like confused. Like, what is this? How can you do this? I, I, he wasn't expecting that. So he pulls Omar to the side. He says, what are you doing? The people won't respect us anymore. We know that they, like, they know that every commoner, when he complains, uh, he's going to uh, be able to make a ruckus in the system uh, in such a way. He says, it's going to make it difficult to govern over people. And so Omar says to him, he says, what? Do you think that God gave us this honor of Islam and God gave us authority over other people so that we can be kings in front of them or kings above them so that they can be our slaves? This is something very important to understand. All of you are very intelligent people. All of you are very handsome and charming and good looking people. All of you are very talented, both physically and intellectually. And you're people who uh, uh, you know, know a lot about the world and know about right and wrong and have ideas about how to make the world a better place and have ways of showing your talents uh, both in your work and in your speech and in your uh, leisure and in your enjoyment uh, and in all these different ways. Um, you weren't given all of these things in order to blow them uh, for enjoyment and you definitely weren't given all of these things in order to uh, use them to abuse other people or to make them into your slaves or to uh, get benefit out of them at their expense for your own benefit. That's not what you were given any of these things for. So Umar said this, he said all of this too. Amr bin As radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Uh, both Amr bin As as well as the, 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 the plaintiff were so shocked by this that the plaintiff said, no, I got my vengeance already. I don't need to partake in this and I forgive whatever right uh, I had against the governor and he leaves it at that. But this is something, this is not like a, this is not something like a storybook. This is not Lord of the Rings. This is not uh, what you call uh, uh, Luke Skywalker, Star, uh, Star Trek, Star, Star Wars. 
This is not any of the, now they have like the new Star Wars, this is gonna be directed by the guy who did the new Star Trek or whatever, right? This is not like storybooks, it's not Hollywood. These are things that actually happen. These are the traditions of our forefathers. If you read through the history of the Muslims again and again, you'll find people who are inspired by these people and they act according to uh, uh, what they learn from them. Uh, uh, I know I've gone on for a long time. When was this talk supposed to be over? I'm pretty sure I've already gone over. How, when was it supposed to be over? I'll try to like wrap it at 15 minutes. Is that too much? Okay, I'll try to make it even less, but like 15 minutes is just gonna kill the mic, it's 15 minutes, okay? Because it's, it's been imams and uh, 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 pastors and rabbis have known to, been known to uh, enjoy the talking. <laughs> it's been suggested. Um, so what happens, I mean, there's too many examples to uh, recall in such a short amount of time, but I wanted to give a, a, an example of what? Uh, something that's in a, in a closer age to us. And uh, that's the example of what? That's the example of uh, Amir Abdul Qadir al Jazairi. Abdul Qadir is a sheikh, he's, a, he's an alim, he's a scholar of Islam, he's not a politician. What happened is when the French will uh, invade Algeria as part of their uh, colonial program. Are there any Algerians here? Or anyone from the Maghreb, Morocco, Tunis, Mauritania, mashallah, we have some, someone in the back or are you just kind of faking? Okay. So what happens is that during the, 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 the program of colonization, um, which is ruthlessly executed, ruthlessly executed, Hundreds of thousands of people are killed uh, in this kind of misguided, arrogant, and self-assured uh, uh, kind of attitude that uh, France had and many European countries shared that they are. Uh, um, they are advanced and civilized people that are there to bring civilization to others. And the fact that, that, that proves that is that they are able to so handily uh, uh, beat them in, in, in war. This is, this is a fallacious line of reasoning. When you beat someone in war, it just means you're better at fighting than them. It doesn't mean that you're more civilized. When you beat someone at war, it just means you're better at fighting than them. So they, 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 they had this kind of project that we're gonna go and civilize these people, and in reality, all they're doing is they're uh, uh, you know, expanding their empire and making money and uh, uh, just seizing people's material things in the, in the wayside, by the wayside, and whoever gets in the way, they kill hundreds of thousands of people who perish uh, 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 under under uh, f French colonial rule in Algeria, and it's something the French government to this day cannot bring itself to even apologize for, much less try to uh, give restitution for. Which you know, who cares? I mean, people get, get on with their lives, but it's it's something that it's important to know what history says because uh, it, it it does it has uh, repeat itself. Uh, it does repeat itself and has repeated itself since then. But uh, what happens is that Amir Abdul Qadir is a, a, a like a teacher of of Quran to children, mostly when you teach Quran, you teach children. Um, and so when he sees his homeland being overrun by the French, um, he organizes a very successful resistance, which as uh, is the case with many uh, anti-colonial resistances, underfunded, undermanned, uh, and, and wildly successful uh, due to uh, factors that are not uh, measurable in material, uh, uh, in material, uh, 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 in material ways. So what happens is that Amir Abdul Qadir, he fights the good fight and when he's finally defeated, uh, he doesn't have this kind of nihilistic outlook that many people have nowadays, unfortunately even amongst the Muslims, which is that of total war, that uh, we'd rather all just go down in a blazing uh, uh, fire of glory than accept a, a new reality in which we're not the winners. He was a person that went on the battlefield that seemed untenable and there was no real uh, positive political outcome that could be affected by continuing fighting. He didn't surrender. And uh, because he was such a popular figure, it would have caused unrest if they had killed him. Uh, so when he's in Syria, what happens is that a, a riot breaks out between the, the, the Druze and the Christians. The Druze are a, uh, a, a kind of a sect that lives up in the mountains uh, in Syria, Lebanon. Uh, they're neither in parts of Palestine. They're neither Muslim nor Christian. They have some sort of kind of pre-Islamic uh, a, a kind of isolated religion that they had and it takes on some Christian and, and, and Islamic motifs but they're neither Muslim nor Christians. The Druze and the Christians get into a fight, uh, into a political fight, into a political tussle and so what happens is that the uh, uh, Christian quarter of Syria, Syria is still to this day the population of Christians is somewhere around 30%. I don't know after the refugee crisis that number has un undoubtedly been disrupted but there's a great number of Christians in Syria. Uh, uh, at least until, uh, until very recently. So what happens is that the, 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 the Christians will uh, uh, um, 
will attack the Druze part of Damascus and the Druze will retaliate. And when the Druze retaliate, they do so in such a way that they will uh, uh, drive the Christians from their quarter and they will, uh, the Christians will flee and seek refuge in the Muslim quarter of town and they will not discriminate between the Syrian Christians and between the European Christians that are there as well. And so what happens is Amir Abdul Qadir, when he sees this happening, because he knows Arabic, oftentimes the colonial, and this happens to this day, believe it or not, uh, the colonial administration has no idea what's going on in the ground uh, because they're taking the orders from a different continent. They have no idea what's going on in the ground. So he actually warns them that this fight is going to become very bad and you need to provide more security for your people. They, uh, these warnings fall on deaf ears. When Christians uh, come flooding into uh, Muslim parts of Damascus and the Druze come uh, 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 with anger uh, uh, chasing after them, Amir Abdul Qadir will actually uh, have a great number of Christians amongst whom are the uh, uh, French, uh, many members of the French diplomatic mission to Syria. So these are people who came to his country, killed so many people, drove him out and he's in exile now and what's happening? He's protecting them from a third party who is bent on, on, on giving them, you know, if a person were, were to think about it in tribalistic terms, essentially giving them what they deserve. But that's not the mandate of justice, that's an emotional reaction. Emotional reaction. You're French, French people did this to me, you're French, therefore I can take this out on you. Whereas a person whose mind is attuned to the, the, the dictates and the necessities of justice knows that what another person did just because they're French, you cannot visit the punishment of that on, on, on a third party because they're French as well. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's a very basic precept. It's a very basic precept. So he says, all of them come stand inside of my house. When the angry Druze mob shows up at his door, uh, he has his sword with him. And he says, if you want to have that Druze in my house, kill me first. And they knew that if they touched him, he's a, one of the, 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 the noblemen and the, and the beloved citizens of Damascus and one of the noblemen and scholars of the Muslims. If they messed with him, it's going to uh, bring a, a, a trouble on their head that's greater than what they can deal with. And for that reason, they're actually, he was actually given a commendation, even our own, strange to, uh, strange to think about that, huh? Like a mujahid, jihad, uh, uh, jihad guy from Algeria. He was actually given commendation by our own Congress, actually, for for the uh, heroism he showed on that day. There's actually a, a, a city, I believe in Indiana, it's called El Qadr, Indiana, E-L-K-A-D-E-R, or it's named after Amir Abdul Qadr uh, in Indiana to this day. Why? Because people even in America were so moved by the fact that this person had no reason whatsoever to uh, uh, show any sympathy, uh, much less uh, actually uh, give protection to uh, 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 the, the Christians of, of, of Damascus that he did so in such an honorable and such a noble way. This is a story. Now, lest we say that, oh, because these stories I told all Muslims are good, we all know this is not the case, but hopefully the idea of this talk is what? Is that we can share with our, uh, our neighbors and our uh, friends and colleagues of other faith uh, traditions um, some part of what we hold to be, uh, uh, hold to be uh, holy and, 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 and dear to us. And also uh, for us, all of us as Muslims and as of non-Muslims to know that we have uh, choices in life, how to behave. And you know, sometimes you'll be able to do great heroic deeds on a great level if you're a great person. If you're like a mediocre person or a small person like myself, then your heroic deeds will be on a small level. Maybe nobody will name a city after you in Indiana. Uh, although I'm not sure still if that's a good thing or not. Because I've, <laughs> anyone here been to Indiana? Anyway, okay. So, uh, uh, but you know, you may, they may not name a city after you somewhere, and they may not give you a commendation in, in the halls of Congress or other, you know, uh, halls of power uh, in the world. But more important than the U.S. Congress bearing witness to it, God bears witness to it. And you will also come face to face with that deed on the Day of Judgment and, uh, uh, you know, do something you'll be proud of, not something that, uh, that you'll be ashamed of, that our forefathers also who did these. Uh, great deeds of heroism that they you know do something such that they will look at us and say they carried our tradition forward and they made us proud rather than being people that even our forefathers on the day of judgment curse us and say we accept the best of examples and made the greatest of sacrifices for your spiritual and material benefit and, uh, and all you did was squander this legacy and this inheritance that we gave to you 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us people of justice. May Allah ta'ala make us people of ihsan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us people of, uh, uh, that give to our relatives and give to our loved ones and give to those who are around us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us people who take off the shoes of our heart before entering the holy, uh, uh, the holy presence of God. Uh, and may He give us His greatest prize, which is that He be pleased with us and forgive us our sins and, and, and uh, make us amongst the ones that He loves both in this world and the hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give tawfiq wa sallallahu wa ta'ala wa ta'ala wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. Questions? Yeah. Questions? Go ahead. Um, when you mentioned the ayah in Allah, I'm not sure, in Allah, I will write you a sign, you will tell me for one and a half, I will not do it. Does Ihsan in that ayah also have the same meaning as Ihsan in that hadith that says, in Allah, I will write you a sign, and you will tell me? Yes, for example. Yeah. Uh, 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 it may, Quranic tafsir is something that fills volumes and this is something the Mufassir can say that the meaning of an ayah may be on several different levels at the same time. It may mean something specifically just to a specific person. Uh, it may mean something in one time and something else in a different time and different age. That's something we would have to look up. Other questions? We give priority inshallah to our, uh, uh, our friends from uh, other faith groups as well because as well, it's a song awareness week. So. Someone had a question. I'll give you this. Go ahead and like throw whatever question you have. A, I won't be offended, and B, inshallah, I won't be frazzled. I don't know. Maybe I will. Maybe it's such a crazy question. I'll get frazzled. But you know, I somehow doubt it. I've you know been at the circuit for some time, and oftentimes the best and most productive questions are those that people ask that are uh, uh, you know that are very direct uh, and very to the point. And you will find that I don't pull punches and try to show the coach stuff either. So go ahead, inshallah, if anyone has any questions. So we'll give priority to uh, people from other faith traditions, but if, even Muslims, if you want to ask some, some question, don't, don't feel timid, inshallah. Going once, going twice. Anyone? Jazakumullah khairan.